this morning in our class, we're going to be beginning a new study on the book of Philippians. And as is customary, at least with an Isaac class, the first lesson is going to be an introduction to the city and also the people where this book was written. I strongly believe that having a knowledge of the first century Greco-Roman world is extremely important for it to understanding the Bible, also understanding the first century Jewish world. But whenever you look at a particular book or circumstance, it's important for you to be able to know the uh, the city, some of the, some of the characteristics of the city, of the people that live there, uh, what daily life was like in some sort of way. And so I, th I think it's important for us to do that as we begin a class. Now, Philippi and Thessalonica are located both in where? Starts with an M. Both, they're both located in Macedonia. And so these are both in Macedonia. And so you would think that this being in the same geographic location, there's not many miles that separate Philippi and Thessalonica. You would think, well, these cities are going to be super similar, right? Because, I mean, you know, you're in Chapel Hill and you go maybe to Cornersville. And there's, you know, decades long rivalry. But, you know, you go back 30 years, there's dairy farms here, there's dairy farms there. You know, you got your pretty much standard religious groups, you know. It's kind of, you know, same geographic location. There's some sort of familiarity when it comes to people. You would think that with Philippi and Thessalonica, but it's actually extremely different. The Thessalonians were a Greek people who had a very strong Greek heritage. And the Philippians, although they are located in the heart of Macedonia, they're not Greek. They're Romans. Now, how would a Roman city be in the middle of Greece? Anybody know? Yeah, right, Steve. A colony of military veterans. And so what happens is, as we'll see here, well, let's just, before we get there, let's, uh, Steve, pause just for a second. And so here on this modern day map, you can see the Mediterranean world, at least southeastern Europe. There you can see Italy on the boot. There you can see that Greece is going to be that dark brown there on the bottom right hand of your screen. Philippi is going to be uh, near the coast in Greece. Here is a map of Paul's second missionary journey. As you can see, Paul leaves and goes up Jerusalem. He goes across Asia Minor. Then he sets sail there. And as he sets sail, he lands in Neapolis and he goes to Philippi. Philippi is going to be the first congregation of the Lord's church in Europe. At least that we know of, right? Now, whether or not there were some Jews there on the day of Pentecost who were baptized who took the gospel message back home with them, we have no idea. But as far as the Bible is concerned that we know of, this is the first Christian congregation on the European continent. And that's going to be where? Philippi, right? Philippi is the first. So next week when I say, where was the first Christian church in Europe? You're going to say Philippi. All right, good, good. And so here you can see on this map uh, between the missionary journey between 49 and 52, and there you can go the last stop that you can see there on that map uh, that we're going to talk about is going to be Philippi. Here's a zoomed in map. So you can see Corinth, Athens, Thessalonica, all very Greek, very proudly to be Greek. And there, Philippi, it's very Roman. It's very different. This is the Via Ignatia. This would have been the road that would have connected Philippi to Thessalonica. This would have been the road that Paul would have traveled on whenever he left Philippi to go to Thessalonica. And so this is the Philippian prison. In Acts 16, we have that story told to us of Paul and the mission team going to Philippi. Paul and Silas are thrown into prison. They are beaten. They are left there the next morning. They are told to skedaddle, to leave town. And Paul stands up and says, Oh no, I'm not leaving town. Because why? I'm a Roman citizen, right? You beat a Roman citizen in public, you're going to apologize in public. Paul didn't reveal the fact that he was a Roman citizen. They might not have given Paul the opportunity to. We're not exactly sure what took place. Uh, Paul may have done this, and so he was able to have kind of a one-up on the Philippian magistrates and maybe try to buy some favor with the Christians that were going to be left. But we think that this may have been the jail cell where Paul and Silas were kept that night. No way to be 100% sure, but it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. 
So what about Philippi, the city? Well, the city was founded in Macedonia by the king of the Macedonians named Philip the Great. Now, Philip is more known because of his son, who is... Alexander the Great, right? And so the Great is a pretty good last name to have, right? That's not exactly how it worked, right? And so uh, Philip the Great was an individual who was able to take the Macedonians. If you like history, you'll like this. If you don't, you won't. Um, in the ancient world, the Greeks had city-states. Some of the more famous city-states are... Athens and Sparta, right? The two main ones, right? There are other city-states, right? There's Thebes, which is also a very powerful, influential city-state. There is Corinth, which is a powerful city-state. You have the, the other city-states around there. You have the Ionian Greeks that are on what we consider modern-day Turkey that are still affiliated and associated with the Greeks. There's all types of city-states everywhere. In the very north of the Greek city-states, you have Macedonia. And the Greeks don't like them because they talk weird. They dress funny. They are more uh, horsemen and riders, whereas the Greeks are more, you know, city statesmen and farmers. And so they look down on the Macedonians. Well, Philip the Great becomes the king of the Macedonians, and Philip the Great spends the next 30 years conquering pretty much all the Greek city states. Now, why is this important? You're like. How does a 22-year-old conquer the entire world? Well, if Daddy raises the best army the world's ever seen and gives them the keys to it, guess what? It's a lot easier then, right? So a lot of people know about Alexander the Great and his military prowess. Less people know the fact that the reason that Alexander the Great was able to accomplish what he accomplished was because of his dad, Philip the Great, who was an amazing uh, general and statesman and warrior himself. And so really groomed Alexander to be his successor. Uh, Philip dies strangely. We're not exactly sure what takes place. There are all types of theories. Um, but anyways, when he dies, Alexander spreads Hellenism throughout the uh, ancient Roman world. But anyways, when Philip the Great, he's a very powerful man. He's a very powerful guy with a strong army. There is a settlement in modern day Philippi, which is known as Crinides. And so these, this is a city of Greeks. They are under attack from, um, from a foreign people, the Thracians. And so they send word to the most powerful Greek general at that time, who is Philip the Great. And they say, look, brother, our fellow Greek, you know, countrymen, whatever. These Thracians are attacking us and we need your help. Would you please come save us? And so Philip the Great sends his army and guess what he does? You know, guess? He runs the Thracians out. And he's like, oh, wait a minute. Y'all have gold mines here? Awesome. They're now mine. <laughs> and so, and Philippi has lots of gold mines and precious metal mines in the ancient world. So Philippi gets there. He runs the Thracians out, realizes the economic potential of having these mines in his kingdom. And so he renames the city to be Philippi. Where do you think he got that name from? Can you imagine ownership in the ancient world being stronger as to walk into a city and saying, Yep, my name's Philip. This town's going to be called Philippi. And you're going to be known as Philippians. You guys like that? Like, and then he's so powerful, you just say, That sounds great, sir. Yeah, whatever you want. Um, and so it's known as Philippi, which is how it is known in, the, in the, the first century and what it is known as today. And so it's located by gold mines. It has a seaport very near to it, Neapolis. That's where Paul sails into when he goes to Europe. And it's also surrounded by very fertile land. And so it's a very, very appealing place. Gold mines, seaport, agricultural land. So then you fast forward a couple of hundred years and Greece is no longer the dominant power in the world. There's another dominant power. Anybody want to take a guess? Rome, right? But Rome's got some issues, right? Julius Caesar has pretty much ended the Republic. He has been killed. Now there is a brutal civil war between Octavian, Mark Antony, who are on the same side at this point, and also between like Brutus and Cassius, right? And so they're fighting, and when they win, Octavian decides that he's going to give his military a military settlement. He says, guys, I'll tell you what we're going to do. 
We're going to find some of the best land in the empire. We're going to just completely flatten everything. We're going to go in with engineers and builders, and we're going to build a Roman city. We're going, to, we're going to make it have a Roman forum. We're going to make it have Roman baths. We're going to make it have Roman streets. It's going to have Roman tiles. It's going to be little Italy in the heart of Greece, and it's going to be beautiful. Everybody's like, sounds perfect. And that's exactly what Octavian does. So Octavian literally builds a city, Philippi, on top of Philippi, but he completely changes everything to where this is going to be a Roman city. When you when people are going to be traveling in the Ignatia, walk up and say, is this, this a Roman city in the middle of Greece? And so this is important because some of the things that Paul talks about in the book of Philippians is more catered to maybe a, a Roman audience than you would think of as being a Greek audience. And that's because the people in the city are different. We can tell this through um, excavation. Um, I have the numbers here. Let's see here. Um, okay, yeah. One of the interesting examples of how Philippi was more Roman than it was Greek is the manuscript evidence that we have from the region. And Greek was the lingua, the lingua franca of the ancient world, which means most things written in the ancient world written in Greek outside of Italy. Well, you have in the heart of Greece, right? This is where Philip of Macedon got his finances to start the campaign that Hellenized the entire ancient world. This is the heart of Greece. And out of the hundreds of manuscripts that we have found, they're all written in Latin except 65. And so hundreds and hundreds of Latin manuscripts in the middle of Greece. And so these people were Roman. They were proud to be Roman. They had Latin ways. They were ruled by the uh, Latin law system and not the uh, Roman law system. And because they were considered to be Rome, they didn't have to pay taxes. Anybody ever work in the military? Anybody ever in the military before? A few of you? Okay. Right? You have a kid on a military base in Germany. Where was he born? Germany. But he's technically on U.S. soil, right? He was in the base, right? I mean, I don't know. Steve, you may know this answer. Can he run for president or she? Yes. Okay. Right? Who was that? Yeah, so U.S., so, 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 so the thing, right? But that's what we think of, right? Because, so if you have somebody born, so even we in our own modern day would say, no, no, that's U.S. soul, right? Even though the Panama Canal is thousands of miles away from what we would consider to be U.S. soul, that still counts, right? Okay, if you lived in Rome, or if you lived in um, Italy, you didn't have to pay taxes, right? That was, that was the, the glory of being in Rome, but if you were in Philippi, you didn't have to pay taxes either because that was considered Roman soul, even in the heart of Greece. Then Paul comes in, and Paul starts preaching what? Starts preaching the gospel. There's another king, right? Who's this king? Jesus, right? And so the Philippians are upset because guess what happens if we start having this, you know, anti-Caesar movement here in Philippi? We lose our tax break, right? You know, and so that's, then, does that sound familiar? Same thing happened in Thessalonica, right? They had a special tax break because they were a free city. And so Paul gets beaten up for taxes in two different cities, right? And so he goes to Philippi. He starts preaching the gospel. People hear it and say, wait a minute. We don't, there's no, there's no the king, right? We don't answer anybody but Caesar. This isn't going to work, and we're not going to start paying taxes. And so we've got to stop this guy. And so that's why these magistrates take Paul and beat him in a proactive measure, right? Because they're thinking that they are keeping themselves away from being in trouble from the law if they beat this guy up, which is complete irony. How? He's a Roman citizen, right? And so they have no clue that this Jew is going to be a Roman citizen. So they're trying to save themselves from Roman law by beating this guy up and then figure out the next day that he's actually a Roman citizen. And so by trying to keep themselves out of trouble from Rome, they've actually got themselves in trouble from Rome. Isn't that interesting? I think it's kind of a spiritual aspect of that too, right? Whenever we try to outsmart God, right? You know, oftentimes it comes to bite us in the butt, right? So it's kind of what happens here. 
And so that's just kind of the background of Philippi. But if you, if you don't realize the fact that it is a Roman city, some of those things in the text are mentioned. You know, why, why is Paul's Roman citizenship brought up in Philippi? Because it's a Roman city. Right, I mean that's that's a Roman. It's like being a Roman, beating a Roman citizen on Roman soil. I mean that's punishable by death. Right, these magistrates have done, and so it's, it's a big deal. And so Roman law, Roman language. Uh, they would have probably spoken Latin there in the city. Diverse religious setting, including worship to Romans, uh, Roman gods, Greek gods, Egyptian gods, and Thracian gods. And so lots of different false gods there. Paul arrived here on a second missionary journey, and of course that is recorded in Acts 16. It's the first congregation in Europe. I think that's a pretty significant uh, st uh, stat. Uh, Luke remains in Philippi for five to seven years. So when we get to Acts 16 and Paul it has to leave Philippi, Luke remains there for five to seven years. Now that's the longest that we know of of somebody staying in one congregation for a continuous time that we know of from the Bible, right? How long does Paul, wh what are Paul's two longest stints? Corinth, he stays there for a year and a half, 18 months roughly. And the longest place he stays is where? Ephesus, right? I heard somebody say it. He stays there for three years, right? Now think about that. The longest place Paul ever stays is three years. And you've got Luke staying in Philippi for five to seven years, right? Now, it is no wonder, at least to me, that you have Luke who stays there for five to seven years, then who is probably the most mature congregation that we see from Paul's letters? Philippi. He doesn't really have anything bad to say when he writes some letters. The letter is mostly of thanksgiving of how well they are doing, thanking them for their gifts, thanking them for their faithfulness. And so it's also the only letter that Paul writes that is addressed to what? Anybody looking at Philippians 1.1? 1, 1? Right? The saints and elders and deacons. Right? It's the only letter that we have that Paul addresses both elders and deacons. Now, I think that that should be interesting to us, right? The Bible tells us in 1, Thess 1 uh, Timothy chapter 3 and uh, also in Titus that there are qualifications for elders, there are qualifications for deacons. We know from the book of Acts that Paul tried to establish elders in every congregation that he established. That is a New Testament model. And yet this is the only congregation that we have where a letter is written to them with both elders and deacons. So what does that show you? It's a mature congregation, right? I mean, you take the fact this is the only time that he addresses his elders and deacons. It's the only letter that is pretty much extremely positive. Philippi is the only congregation that we know of that supported Paul for a, a long period of time throughout his missionary work, even after he left um, Greece. And so you see a really strong, mature congregation. I mean, to Philippi's credit, right? And so maybe we should, we should consider this first congregation in Europe as being a strong congregation. What can we learn from this congregation, right, and its maturity? Well, part of that maturity is having stable leaders there for five to seven years to help root that congregation in its teaching and preaching. Now, after the seven to five to seven years that Luke is there, where does he go? You give me the person of the place. He goes back to Paul, right? And so he's away from Paul for five or seven years. He goes back. He rejoins Paul. He's going to be with Paul when Paul's in prison in Caesarea. He's going to be on, with Paul as he goes to where he needs shipwrecked on the Isle of Cyprus. And then when he goes to Rome. And so he writes this letter uh, in about 62 while he's in prison in Rome. And so uh, he sends hello from the Praetorian Guard, which from uh, Caesar's guards. And about this time is when Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon is also written. And so we're studying Ephesians in our Sunday morning sermons. And so while we're kind of going through the book of Ephesians, it may be good for us to remember that about the same time that Paul was writing Philippians to the congregation in Philippi. Ephesians is the congregation that Paul stays at the longest amount of time. The Philippi is the congregation that we know of that a missionary personnel was there for the longest amount of time that we know of in the Bible. Uh, church tradition says that John was also at Ephesus for a long time, but that's just church tradition. So any questions or comments, kind of the background and history of Philippi or the congregation or of Paul's work there.
Jack? I didn't know all that. I wanted to thank you for telling us all that, but nobody's ever, never heard that. I could read that, but they don't say that in the, you know, in the Bible. So I'm, I'm so glad you teaching that. It's like a history lesson. Well, I, I, well, Jack, I just want to say thank you. If you couldn't hear Jack, let me tell you what Jack said. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Jack was just saying thank you for the history, the history background and knowledge because he has not heard that before. Brother Jack, what, how, how old are you, Brother Jack? How old am I? Yeah. You got to count? Let me figure it out. Okay. <laughs> Jack's 84. Jack and I are from the same place, roughly, and so we, we like to pick and kid. Um, but uh, Jack's 84 and has never heard that before. Oftentimes, Jack, that's not a good thing. But I think in this case, it is a good thing. Um, but um, And I appreciate that because I know some of you hate history, right? And some of you are like, I stayed for Bible class. Why are we talking about this? This increases your knowledge and understanding of the Bible when you read it. Um, if you don't know who's writing and who's receiving a letter, it's hard for you to read it and to understand exactly what's being expressed in that letter, right? Um, if I give you a letter between two individuals and you've never met that individual before, can you learn something about that letter? Of course you can. But if you know the individual on a deep level, can you know more about the, the things mentioned in that letter? Well, of course you can. And so I think it is extremely important for us to take some time. And so if you're the type of person, and I know those who are like, I hate these classes because I don't like history, just uh, humor me. I think it, it will be in your benefit. So thank you, Jack, for saying that. Um, any other questions or comments? I, I find it interesting. One of the other things that we got to remember is the first person Paul met at Neapolis was Lydia. Oh, yeah. And where he left uh, Philippi, he stayed with Lydia. And in, in, if you remember, when Lydia was converted, she had Paul and then stayed with her. And she was a wealthy woman because of what she did. And so not only do you have an established church there, you have someone there who evidently has some wherewithal in financials as well. Hmm. Just like Todd said, the first, the first convert on European soil is a woman from Asia named Lydia, which is kind of interesting. But, um, but yeah, the first, the first convert on European soil that we know of is Lydia, right? As soon as Paul gets there. And because Paul doesn't have anywhere to stay, he converts Lydia, who's a wealthy individual. He has a place to stay while working there. And then, to show the providence of God, perhaps, he's taken, beaten, and thrown in prison. And then guess what happens? He converts the Philippian jailer and his family, right? And so, like you were kind of saying, that, that kind of, you know, always looking for an opportunity. And Philippi, the, Philipp, the, the Philippian history in Acts, and also the book, is a wonderful reminder of that. Uh, to be able to look and spread the gospel, even despite the circumstances. Good. Anyone else? Steve? It's interesting, uh, you know, Well, Mark. Mark. Yeah. But if you look at the volume of material that Luke recorded that came down to us, that he was not a possible, but yet Luke and Acts, and that tells you all. Oh, yeah. Luke and Acts make up 24% of the New Testament. And so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 100% of the historical account that we have, as far as being a history. Yeah, and so, no, Luke is an extremely, extremely important figure that is oftentimes overlooked. But you take the amount of years that he spent, like in Philippi, you talk about the amount of time he spent with Paul on his missionary journeys, the different cities he worked in with Paul, the fact that he wrote at least 24% of the New Testament with the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And also, you know, there are some who would propose that... Um, he may have may have wrote Hebrews too, and so and if that is true, which I'm not saying it is, but I'm saying if if, then of course that percentage goes up in the New Testament. So. Yeah, 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 and and some some propose that maybe Luke was from Philippi. Now, that's just a, that's just a, there's no evidence for that whatsoever other than the fact that he stays there for so long. But Lucas is a, you know, it's just a, it's a, kind of a Roman name, so, but who knows? No, no, no.
pro Jew, Roman hating group of a Roman hating people. Yeah. It's interesting how is he now born into Roman citizenship? It's a great question. The only thing that we're told from the Bible is that he got it from his grandfather. And uh, we're told that in the book of Acts. I believe when he is on trial there in, uh, in Acts 22, but it may be in Acts 16 while he's in Philippi. I'm not sure which one, but we are told that he got it from his father's father. It's, it's the, uh, the captain of the guard that took him up um, out of the Jewish mob. Because I, I paid so much for it. That's right. He said he was free. That's right. And so, yeah. And so, um, Acts 21. Yeah. Right. And maybe a little less. His ancestors were not so much. Right, you know, and as his dad and granddad living in Tarsus, you know, away from Jerusalem, living in the midst of Greeks and Romans, it's probably a little bit harder to be, we hate Rome, you know, in Tarsus than it is in Jerusalem. Uh, but great question, though. Great question, though. Yeah. And when you kind of read about Silas and back up, there's a pretty good chance that Silas himself may have also been a Roman citizen. Uh, it'd be interesting that so now, you know, if he won, you got two of them. Together. Yeah. I haven't thought about that, but that's but that's interesting. We can't, we can't, John? How did Paul, other than word of mouth, how would he prove that he's a Roman citizen? They kept a certificate on them at all times. It was, it, was the, it was your most prized possession in the ancient world. Like if you were a Roman citizen, you took it everywhere you went. Because if you lied about it, that's it. Yeah, if you, if you lied about being a Roman citizen, it was, the punishment was death, execution. And so like it would have been, it would have been a, 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 like a document bound in leather that you would have kept safe at all times. I mean, that was your get out of cross free card, literally, you know. And so, good. That's a great question, though. Yeah, the Romans were smart. You know, the legions were Roman citizens. They served 20 years. They did not get settled. Right. If you were an auxiliary. Right, you were an auxiliary. Yeah. 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 Yeah, normally not. But there are other ways that, that you get Roman citizenship too. I mean, Paul's, Paul's grandfather could have been a wealthy merchant who bought it because he thought it would be a good thing to have. I mean, we just don't know. Good questions all the way around. Um, as far as the letters, the most personal of Paul's letters, they were a source of support for Paul. Luke remains there for five to seven years. The only Paul letter mentioning elders and deacons. Some of our conclusions for today's class, the importance of Philippi in the ancient world. Philippi was an extremely important city in the ancient world because it was a Roman colony. And so it, it stood out above the rest as being, you know, Rome was the center of the earth, technically, you know, and so that was, that was a representation of power and wealth to the spiritual maturity of the congregation. I think it's something that we're all trying to be. We're trying to be spiritually mature Christians, a part of a spiritually mature congregation. And so part of that comes from Luke working with them for five to seven years and making sure they're equipped in the Word. There's a reason when Paul writes this, he doesn't have a list of grievances they're doing wrong like the Corinthian congregation. Right? He's got he's got he's got you know, he's all the time trying to fix something in Corinth. The Philippians are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, how do they know what they're supposed to be doing? Well, they're following the instructions that Luke has left with them. And so spiritual maturity is this is doing what God wants us to do. Paul's close relationship with them, faithfulness over time, and mutual encouragement. Uh, Paul was an encouragement to the Philippian congregation. The congregation was an encouragement to Paul, just like we should be an encouragement to each other. Um, the elders ought to be an encouragement to the members. The members ought to be an encouragement to the elders. Same for the ministers and the, and the members. Same for the members and the members. Like We should all just be encouraging each other together, right? And uh, when we do that, 
will grow as Christians, but the congregation will also grow as a whole. Um, that's all the time that we have. Uh, any, any uh, I would ask for questions or comments, but it's literally uh, 1129. So uh, we're going to go ahead and close with prayer. Thank you so much for your attendance. Wonderful crowd this morning and uh, wonderful questions and comments. And next week we'll jump right in, uh, starting with Philippians 1.1. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and for all the many blessings you've given us. We're so thankful for the encouragement that we have through the Scriptures. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us to be diligent students of your Word, to be able to read it and study it and to get excited about it and the implementation of your Word into our lives. Please help us to be Christians who are continually searching to mature both as individuals but also to help our brothers and sisters mature as a congregation. And dear Heavenly Father, as we begin our study on the book of Philippians, please help us to look to see how the Philippian congregation was able to be faithful and true to you in a difficult time, in a difficult place in, in your church's history. And dear Heavenly Father, please help us to be shining lights in this community that we can also be looking for those who need to respond to the gospel. It's in your name we pray. Amen.